Hi. <laughs> Just checking it's working. Oh, I'm back in my little spot here. I quite like it. So today I want to talk, this is part six of the Freedom series, and I'm going to talk about travel. And this is a really interesting one to talk about right now, because obviously during the coronavirus pandemic, we, most of us can't travel. Most of us are staying in our homes. Um, and some of us can go out for a walk. Some of us can't. And so the concept and talking about travel right now seems fairly ridiculous. Except that there's a lot that we can learn, a lot that we need to use a lot of skills and a lot of intelligence and awareness that we learn from travel that's absolutely vital right now and I talked before when I was talking about work um, about how sometimes we got used to being a certain way or sometimes we got used to being to doing a certain thing and the biggest thing that springs to mind is how I've seen the fashion world uh, pivot you know using that word pivot to go from whatever they were doing to just drop everything and to be sourcing material and cutting patterns and stitching and sewing and making scrubs and all kinds of gear for the NHS, which absolutely blows my mind. And a friend was also saying the other day that she's making, you know, these sort of bonnets, these, these protective covering things, just from old sheets, which was just amazing. You know, so many people are using skills in a different way. So either you're using old skills or new or, or the, the skills you've been working on in a completely different way. And uh, I think the thing is, for people who've been doing a lot of travel, you might be thinking, well, you know, I'm on holiday, I'm on furlough, I'm not doing anything. And so I want to talk to that as well, because I think there's a lot of ways we can look at travel and what we've experienced and how we go about traveling that is extremely useful now and will become more and more useful and actually imperative for us around the world. So stay tuned for that. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my experiences with travel as well. And it's funny how we've used this word and this concept of traveling and how it's shifted uh, in, in not so very long, in less than a hundred years. So it's kind of funny, somebody was talking to me the other day and they said, you know, traveler. Um, and in the UK, that's a word that sometimes people use to um, relate to a certain, what's the word, possibly ethnic group or people with a certain um, culture and it was, you know, it was kind of said in a derogatory way I think um, and I'm not going to go into that right now but the funny thing I always find because I do my books and I do um, write about spas and things like that so, so sometimes my book come up in categories which are resorts and spas for travellers, you know. So the word traveller is used in a completely different way then. And, uh, you know, there are many, many cultures around the world that are nomadic or have an element of the nomad within their, you know, their life. And, and the one that I always thought about when I was, well, I went on a kind of a big long journey around the world was the, um, I think it's the Aboriginal uh, you write a passage of going on a walkabout and so that a person goes off on their own and they go walking and it's like they kind of surrender to whatever the, the world, whatever the earth wants to show them and that was something that really resonated with me when I was travelling because I felt like there was a purpose to it and there was a, a truth seeking you know, to what I was doing and so, you know, I always come back to the Camino de Santiago, which I did. And so the word there is caminante, uh, which is translated as pilgrim. You know, kind of funny, I think of John Wayne now, it's always saying pilgrim. <laughs> but caminante, although it means pilgrim, it just means someone following the way. So the way could take you anywhere. And... Uh, also, I was thinking about in the Native American culture, a lot of people do a thing called a vision quest. 
and they it might only be for a few hours or it might be for a day or it might be and it's that thing of going somewhere in order to learn a truth and the word that came to me and that I kind of eventually sort of resonated with and really want to call myself is somebody which is a geomancer and very few people understand the definition of this word because it's been used as uh, somebody who um, uh, uses like you know stones and runes to read fortunes and that's one kind of definition but for me you know the the word the other definition of it is to go somewhere and allow the earth to teach you I suppose it's very appropriate that I'm doing this on Earth Day you know or the day after Earth Day so as I was walking and I've written all about this is I would be going somewhere and I would the place would teach me and sometimes I hear people writing about places and things and people and going somewhere like they're ticking off a list, like they're um, conquering a place. You know, it's definitely the feeling behind the way we talk about places like going to Mount Everest. And I, I always felt that I was going somewhere in order for the place to conquer me, you know, to get rid of illusions that I had, to teach me something maybe about myself or about the world or just you know to meet people who would show me something and really it was a kind of way of healing and that doesn't always mean that it was a good thing you know in a sense of sometimes I went to places where women were treated a certain way where they didn't have the same rights and privileges that I had so going to those places taught me more about what I had in, in my life and it was very common when I was traveling that people would look at me and, and be like oh you're you're traveling on your own you know you're you know you're like a man you are because you're you know you you're not married and you have this you know you you act as if you can just go anywhere and do anything and so in a way there was a kind of a waking up as well both sides and the people I met we you know there was a, a connection and a and a shift as well because, for example, by going to countries like that and talking to people, you know, I was really learning something about them. But what I was sharing with them was how amazing I thought they were to have to, to you know, with what they were doing in the place that they were doing it and how challenging that was for them. So for me, travel has never really been like, you know, ticking, ticking countries off the list. And so I think there is a danger, and I see that sometimes with this sort of travel community, and I think that's something we need to address, especially in the present moment, because there, there is a backlash, and there will be more of a backlash, I think, to the sort of fast travel and the unconscious travel of, let me go to Paris just so that I can say I've been to Paris. You know, I, and I lived in Paris, you know. And there were times I didn't want to be in Paris, you know. I, I got a bit kind of trapped there at times because I didn't have any money and I couldn't come, come home, I couldn't come back to England. And that was through some pretty tough times. Um, so, you know, I do feel for you guys, if you, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this because you, you know, you consider yourself to be a traveler and say maybe now you're in a part of the world that you didn't expect to be in for quite so long. I feel for you, I do. But I'll come back to that too. Okay, so bear with me. Bear with, bear with. But another thing I would talk about is when I made the decision to leave my house and to, to sell my house, and I and I'd done quite a bit of travelling before that. I'd spent, you know, up to about a month away from the house. And I travelled to Mexico and, and places like that. Um when I when I'd done that, when I when I decided to sell the house and go travelling. It took a while, you know, because there was a, it was kind of a slow market because it was just around the time of Brexit, you know, when we'd had the vote. And literally it was the day of the Brexit vote that I put my house on the market and then the, just everything got quiet. So it took, even though it was a flat in London, it took uh, quite a few months, you know, for somebody to, to want to buy it. And um, at the time it was, it was tortuous. It was really tortuous because I... I had to keep sort of going 
living my life and you know part of it felt a lot like treading water and I can feel you know at the moment there are elements of this time you know but for me that time back then was uh, much more painful because I had this feeling of like needing to go and needing to get out in the world and needing to keep going with the healing process that had started in me but I, I think there was a, a divine wisdom <laughs> always in keeping me in that place because my mother was still going through chemo and in a sense I didn't really know what I was going to do next I didn't really know where I was going to go and I, and I, I had one of those big books of all the places to go in the world that someone had given me and I was always looking you know where am I going to go what am I going to do and during that time, what coming up, kept coming up for me was the Camino de Santiago. And slowly, slowly, that became a thing where at a certain point I just went, you know, I've got to go and do this. I don't know why I've got to go and do this, um, but it's, it's calling me. It's, you know, I'm being called to this place. And a lot of times I went somewhere. Sometimes I went somewhere to get on the way somewhere else. And I got there and I was like, oh, wow, there's something that I really connected with in that place. Sometimes I stayed somewhere just because I could not get myself on a plane I could not like my body was so kind of bent out of shape I couldn't get on a, on a plane uh, or I had you know sickness or something like that but during that time I was in Wimbledon and so it was three four months I was in one place and I'd been there for over 20 years but one of the things that really happened was I had to keep getting out and going places so I had to keep going for walks um, and in that area and so I would be going to the woods there was a woods and it was a park quite close to me and I explored those areas and I was there first thing before dawn and I was climbing trees and I was wandering in the woods and I spent more time in those woods in those you know three months than I did in over 20 years and so at that time there was a kind of I had this desperate need to go and it was like a rocket, you know, the energy was building up in me. And for some of you, this might be what you're experiencing at the moment, that feeling of needing to be somewhere, go somewhere. And I would just say, I know it's hard, but allow that energy to build. Don't try and stifle it, because that is the energy that will take you there the moment you can go. You know, the moment you're ready to go, you might need this sort of, um, you know, when you kind of like, you know, you put pressure on something and the, and the pressure builds up inside of it <laughs> to go. And then when you, you know, it's like a rocket ship. The moment you're ready, boom, you go. So just remember it's part of a process. You know, if you're suddenly feeling, why have I never gone to this place? This place has been calling me for years or suddenly somewhere new has come up to you. Hold on to that. Don't let it go. Don't try and stifle it. If you're feeling that very often, it's for a reason. You know, there is a reason, there is a reason why we have a longing for certain places. And one of the things I found is, you know, at times when I was going somewhere, I'd go, right, I'm going somewhere, I'm going here, I'm going there. People go, why do you want to go there? That's no good, that's rubbish. Oh, don't go to, don't go to Hawaii, it sucks, you know, that kind of thing. Well, if you've let yourself be swayed by that in the past, and you've gone somewhere, you know, I spent a lot of time going to places to see friends, to see, fam you know, to with family. And there's a point when you suddenly realise that, that calling is your calling, you know, and and sometimes you just got to do it, you know. There's a reason why you have that calling, what that that there's something calling to you. And when I finally did sell the house, uh, I finally did leave. It was it was really difficult because I still had that urge and that need to go, um, and I knew I had to go. But at the same time, I found it terribly, terribly difficult, terribly, terribly difficult to leave. Um, because, you know, I was, you know, I didn't want to leave my family and things had been so tough. And so I went, you know, I really was saying I'm going to go for a month. I'll be going for a month and then I'll be back. I'll be back for Christmas. Um, but when I went, you know, the moment I got on that plane and... I got on that plane, I was so scared. It was such a scary time. And then the moment I arrived, I arrived in Seville. And I, um, so I went 
I went, you know, and I got the bus into town and then I walked across the bridge with my rucksack and everything. And as I did that, I, I just felt, you know, I was born for this. You know, I was born for this. I was made for this. And there were moments of that, and there were moments of, why am I doing this, you know? And I think there's going, as I say, I think there's, there has been a backlash, there will be a backlash to unconscious travel. But I think that's the same thing as our unconscious consumption. You know, and that we can say the same about the fashion world. We could say the same about supermarkets. Um, we could even say the same in many countries about healthcare and the way we sort of abused it. And so this is a great moment, or rather this is a moment in which I think we have to wake up you know, to a lot of things we have been doing and being. So for me, when I was traveling, what I would often find is I would get to a point where suddenly I had learnt the lessons, I had learnt what I was meant to learn. And I've written about this quite a lot. And suddenly I would feel you know, it was very Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, you know, there's no place like home. And it was time to come back to England and it was time to come, come here. And very often that calling, you know, that, that sort of boomerang, come home feeling, I would arrive and something big was happening with my family that none of, none of us knew was going to happen. So that, what do you call, conscious, that, that travelling, following the heart, can often take us to places and put us in places where we're meant to be, where, you know, it's the right place. I would say, if you follow your heart, you will arrive in the right place at the right time. But as we've, I've talked before in other things about sometimes we get caught up and we decide this is our identity, you know, so uh, you're not you if you're not traveling at 90 miles an hour, you're not doing that. But I found many times that there's been a time for me to stop and be in a certain place for several months. And I've actually sought to stay in that place. I've been looking for accommodation to stay in a place. And it just hasn't happened. And I think, well, okay, you know, the universe has given me a push to kind of go off again and, and learn something and do something. And for me, those, you know, the, the, I think that was true. I think there was something that I had to to learn and something I had to experience and something I had to let go of in order to be able to come back to myself. So I think I think the thing is one of the things we're going to have to be aware of as we move forward is that we you know we have to be mindful of what it's costing us to travel. Of course we do as as with everything else and the impact of our travel on cultures um, even before the coronavirus I think you know, there was always, <laughs> always noted, you always notice the people who come to a culture are seeking to learn and being respectful and, um, you know, trying to honour the place and the people who are kind of riding roughshod over it. And for me, that was a big thing when I was in Southeast Asia that, you know, it, we have a concept in the UK, you know, we watch these films like the best exotic marigold hotel about everyone going to India and you get to India and they're like no thank you no we have visas and we don't want people like in Thailand we have big signs saying you know don't overstay your visa don't just hang out here you know this is you know we don't want that um, <laughs> in the nicest possible way um, unfortunately sometimes the people who are coming to a place create problems and that's in Spain I've seen that um, in Seattle, uh, in in many places around the world, and I did notice that in Southeast Asia because um, what I found very interesting was when I went to when you go to Bhutan. So Bhutan is the country that's got a very high; they charge an awful lot of money uh, for you to come and stay in the country, and that's because you're not allowed in the country without a guide and a driver, and the money goes to you know the, the country and it helps pay for the schools the healthcare, all those kind of things so there's a there's a sort of <laughs> it's kind of an elite kind of backpacking because it because it ain't you know when we did our trip you know we were quite simple places that we say beautiful but quite simple lovely people you know everything was was really well done um but it was it was a tough it was a tough journey 
you know, because this is not a country where, um, you know, this is a country that, that has, has the, where the road is quite a new concept, you know, having roads is quite a new concept, so. And it's a real eye-opener to go somewhere like this. But the whole point of them having a very high tourist fee to come into the country is to prevent a sort of a swarm of tourists and travellers coming in with their own culture or rather no culture. So people who who don't respect, you know, the culture, people who won't <laughs> say cover up <laughs> in certain places, people who you know, you're not allowed to go into a temple without a guide. Um, and then, you know, having travelled and been to Bangkok and other places I can you know I, I go to a temple where I see people are really ignoring all the rules and they're again swarming and creating all kinds of problems in that area and you could look at somewhere like a place that I really love and is, is really close to my heart is um, Cancun in Mexico and but you know I went there at a time that was a very very busy time of year and one of the things I experienced was, um, I remember I went, I was staying in this one little pocket of the jungle left in Cancun. And I went for a walk and I went out and all there was were high rise, um, hotels and construction. And I couldn't even make it to the beach. I was like, well, you know, this, I'm walking on concrete. It was so hot. And this was very early in the morning. And again, I went down to some other places along that coast and it was very built up. You know, there was big walls against the sea and you know you think well I'm trying to get back to nature here and and I went to Tulum and I didn't even go to the beach because like, I can't take it if 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 they've done to the beach in Tulum what they've done everywhere else I can't take it so I won't go but there there's places like Aquamel uh, where the the turtles breed and they you know and the the word from the locals is Please stop coming here to the tourists. Please don't come. Please don't come here. We've got too many tourists and it's disturbing the turtles. And and yet you still see people saying, oh, yes, go to Cancun. Yes, go to Cancun. And I'm not saying don't go to Cancun. I'm saying that, you know, if you and when you go to Cancun, follow my guides. Because I've got some great guides on finding really lovely, you know, small places. Go to the off-the-beaten-track places. And go at times when it's quieter, you know. And go to Baja. <laughs> and it's difficult because we have to understand it's very much like where we are at the moment in that I love my grandma, but I can't go and kiss and cuddle her. I love my mother and my brother, but I can't really see them at the moment because they're, you know, they're, they're so vulnerable. So in order to protect them and to love them, I have to actually keep my distance. And that's something that we need to be aware of in terms of travel and tourism and being aware of where we go somewhere. I always remember a town called Loretta in, um, I think it was Loretta, in in Baja. And I remember getting off the bus there and uh, being a bit lost and a chap came up to me. He said, oh, you know, how can I help you find you? He was such a sweet guy. And he, it was such a small town that I bumped into him later, you know, in the town. And he said, Thank you for coming to our town. Thank you for coming. You know, and in that town, it was like, you know, thank you for coming because we don't have enough tourists. You know, and that's one of the things that we have to be aware of when we're doing anything. You know, there, there, are, there are the oversubscribed and then there's the smaller, quieter places that appreciate our custom and need it. So we're either a great teacher Sadhguru is saying at the moment you know about this crisis we're either part of the solution or we're part of the problem and that's very true with travel you know that we are um, when we go somewhere you know we can be the tourist that buys the 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 shells and the coral and things like that that people have taken and we can support you know the negative behavior uh, and I think it's Miami that's a big sign that, you know, no, no shells and things like that. Or we can be the people who, you know, when I said when I when I went to Hong Kong, I went to China, that we can go to the temples and we can buy 
all the, the stuff that the nuns and the monks are making that support the local schools and things like that. So we can try to be a lot more um, conscious, you know, about everything that we eat and everything that we buy and everything that where we stay and what we wear and all those things. So anyway, <laughs> that's actually not the biggest thing I want to talk about in this terms of freedom and travel. Because right now, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, this is my identity, this is what I do, I'm a traveller, da 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 da. And, you know, you could call me that. You know, I've, I've done a lot of travelling, I've been in the same, but I, I'm not, I'm not, what's the word? I'm not identified, you know, I'm not um, defined by where I live. And I always remember when I moved, when I, when I finished that particular tour you know and I went and moved into a big house on the beach uh, because it was available and it was really dirt cheap and it was like a four or five bedroom house on the beach and I, I remember talking to someone who said you know I'm the same person when I couldn't pay the mortgage on my studio flat in London as when I'm renting this great big gorgeous four or five bedroom house on the beach I'm the same person you know I'm, I've changed a lot <laughs> but why should you respect, why should people respect you more because you've got a big house somewhere nice? You know, why should people respect you more because your postcode? Why should people respect you more because you've been to so many countries or, or so many, tra you know, travelled to so many places? And very often it's the people who, in my life, it's the people who've given up so much money and travel in order to provide for their family, in order to support their family. You know, those people, sh you know, I have huge respect, huge respect for her. the travel that they have done has been on a shoestring because they've given so much money to other people, you know. So it is an ego thing to to kind of think we're better than anybody else because we've travelled to more countries or, you know, been to Bhutan. <laughs> um, and yeah, just, just, you know, I can't calculate it. I had stayed in over 130, 130 places in a year. And that didn't include, like, staying with friends and family as well. So I've, I've done that. I've done that sort of travelling. And I, I'm happy to say I did it with heart. And I, and I stopped when I needed to stop. And my mother said to me when I was doing this, she said, she said to me, she said, I'm worried about you. She said, I'm worried because... This kind of traveling, you know, can become addictive. It could be, you know, that, that this is something that you know you would develop addic addiction to, you know, having to go somewhere new, having to be somewhere new. Um, and I can totally see that. Uh, but I think the thing is, is if we're aware, we can be aware of when that traveling no, no longer serves, no longer serves us, no longer serves the community or the population. And that's usually when I find somewhere really, really cheap. <laughs> I turn up somewhere after all this travelling and I find someone and I go, oh, I could stay here forever. And it's really cheap and they really want me and they need the, you know, everything about this place is perfect. And I go, yeah, it's time to go home. <laughs> and I go, why, why? Uh, but that's that's the way it is. And sometimes it's great because then you found that place and it's a place you can come back to at another time uh, when there's a need. And um, But one of the things I always say, you know, about travelling is, is actually when we look at it that the environmental cost of traveling can sometimes be a lot lot less than we think and it can be a lot lot less than having uh you know a house in london or a house somewhere cold or they're paying for heating bills and things like that so i would say we must be careful that we we look at the concept of travel in a logical way as well as in a spiritual way in the sense that when i did the camino de santiago you know, I was staying in the cheapest places, I was walking, um, and it cost more than if I had just got on a plane and gone somewhere. Because I had the cost of each hotel I was staying in, and this is not just a financial cost, this is the, you know, the energy cost of staying in a hotel, heating that room, um, you know, possibly I could be travelling on public transport, so buses and things like that. But also the food I was eating. Every day I was starving. I had to eat like thousands of calories, which had to be grown somewhere. And, you know, the water had to be done and da da da. Whereas, and that took me, you know, so it was, it was weeks, you know, and it would have been more if I had walked the whole way. It would have been 
you know, eight weeks or something. So you think about the the carbon cost of those eight weeks of slow travel is a lot more, <laughs> you know, than me getting on a on a scheduled flight. And it's those kind of things that sometimes we can miscalculate what what is important and what's going on. And I think things sometimes there's a time for slow travel and sometimes there's a time to just go exactly where we're supposed to be going and get there as eff efficiently as we can, you know, to go very quickly to where we need to go. Um, it, it kind of saves, it saves, saves all kinds of energy and that kind of thing. But, um, so, you know, there's a lot of practicals about actually traveling and exploring. And, but that's, that's, I wanna leave that for a moment and talk about another aspect of travel especially for those of you who consider yourself travellers or have done a lot of travel and now feel as a difficulty. Because I keep seeing, so on Instagram I follow a lot of people who are travellers, travel influencers, photographers, people like that. And um, so what I keep hearing is, where are you going to go? Where's the first place you're going to go when this is over? I really feel really annoyed I can't go somewhere new. I'm annoyed that I can't go to a new town or a new city or a new place in the woods. And I could say, oh well there's lots of places to explore near you. I could say you can explore your memories. I could say you could go to all your photos. I could say all that. And it would be true, you know, and it might be useful to you. But I want to say something very different and possibly a bit controversial, which is this. You are not just in a new country. You are not just in a new town. Right now, you are in a new world. And so, one of the things that I discovered when I was traveling, and I'm sure you know this, is that I was always changing. I was always becoming somebody different. And the places that I was going to were changing as well. So often I would be going on a journey that would go this way. By the time I came back to that same place, that same hotel, even the same room, I was a different person. And funnily enough, some places I went to, things weren't quite right. You know, I'd go somewhere, stay somewhere, and the room wouldn't be quite right. And I would come back and they would go in a different room and I would think, ah, this is where I was meant to come. Even though it was technically the same place, it was like, you know, like a piece of clothing that didn't fit. And then when I came back, I had kind of put on weight or lost weight or whatever. And suddenly that, that thing fit me. And it's funny because I feel that way about the place I'm living now, because, you know, when I first moved here, um, you know, there were things, and I was like, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, blah, blah, blah. but it's, right now it's perfect. You know, this is, but it's perfect for this time, it's perfect for this moment. And so whatever brought me here, and how I turned up and came here, um, it, it was almost like something within me knew that this was the right place for me to be. So if you are somewhere right now that you didn't expect to be, I think it's really worthwhile taking time to look where you are. Because the world has changed from when you arrived. The world has changed from when you moved in. And even though when I was living in Wimbledon and I was, you know, I was feeling I needed to escape from where I was, I had all the woods and trees and everything around me to support me during that time, that difficult time. And since I've been travelling and been to so many places, I appreciate much more what I had back then. I appreciate that that was a very wonderful place that I could um, go off and have that kind of wonder. And even now I think, well, you know, as much as I wouldn't want to be there in London right now, you know, the, it had a lot going for it. <laughs> but coming back to this new world, you know, I'm one of the people that I'm always really inspired by is um, George Orwell, who wrote uh, Down and Out in Paris and London, which is a 
incredible book. It's not really about travel, but it's about what he used to call vagabonding, which is just heading off with, you know, a stick, <laughs> you know, kind of like with a stick over his shoulder. A lot like I was doing, heading off with a rucksack and just going places. And although I never, you know, I always stayed in quite nice places, generally, generally had some issues. Um, it was that feeling of, of letting go and just sort of falling forward and also seeing how people are treated when they're traveling, seeing what the world is like from a completely different perspective. And that's also really, really important because it's one thing to live in a society when you're viewed in one way. It's one way to live in a society when everybody says you're great. But what about when you look like a traveller? What happens when you look like a tourist in a city that doesn't really want any more tourists, where people give you the eye? Because, you know, what are you doing here? Why aren't you at home? <laughs> Which is a look that a lot of people are getting right now. And there's a, a, you can understand that sort of that phrase there. But of course, I always come back to the thing about being an explorer, you know, that we are explorers, we're not just travellers, we're not just tourists. And going with an explorer mindset doesn't mean to say necessarily going to the highest mountains or the places where nobody's been before. It's, it's really about being open, you know, to what a place can teach us, what, what I would say, what a place can learn us. <laughs> But this new world that we have, I find it sometimes scary. I find it challenging to figure out what the truth is. And so we need people. We need people now and we will need people to explore our world, to tell the truth not just what we see in magazines or in, you know, fancy pants, travel influence, um, in, in sort of account, you know, where everything is so glossy and perfect and beautiful and this and that and the other. Because the truth is sometimes being the person that goes somewhere and says, I'm sorry, but, you know, this place doesn't exist anymore because we've got too many tourists because the water level has risen, risen and we can't go to that beach, doesn't exist anymore. And that happened to me a lot of occasions. I would turn up somewhere and the guidebooks were wrong. And actually that's why I started writing about guide, uh, writing guidebooks in the first place when I was writing about China, because it was so different to what I was reading in guidebooks. And what people have written in guidebooks could get you killed because it wasn't accurate, you know. And somebody had written it once and then somebody else had copied it and somebody else had copied it. And one of the biggest questions I always ask when I travel anywhere is, you know, is it safe to walk around here? I usually go to a hotel or a guest house or an Airbnb and my first question is, is it safe to walk around here? And, you know, nine times out of ten, I would get the truth and usually I would get a little bit more cautious you know because I'm a woman on my own I'm a white woman on my own so sometimes I would get well you know maybe you know maybe you should take a taxi or we can arrange a taxi for you or um, yes during the day but maybe not in the evening or you know things like that but I remember one place I went to and I asked that question oh yes 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 it's so safe around here, it's really safe around here. And I thought, it does not feel safe. You know, this does not feel like a safe place. And these were lovely people, they were really, really nice people, it was a hostel. But even walking there, I had got this very um, concerned feeling in my bones about where I was. And so then I, you know, when I, when I went out, I was like, yes, it's so not safe. 
and actually I got stopped by people I got stopped by like the local fishermen and people like that and they just said no you shouldn't be walking around just sit here where we can keep an eye on you until until it's you know this was early in the morning so they said you know sit here until it's light until um, you know you shouldn't be walking around on your own this is too dangerous so that was the truth of the place and it's very important that we share the truth about where we are you know that's so important about travel and exploring and that as individuals we, we are witnesses and we are journalists we are the media when we share about a place and you know it's very important that when we write about a hotel or, or something like that that we tell the truth and <laughs> very often I write on TripAdvisor it's always the bad reviews <laughs> Because it's the hotels I feel that people need to be warned about because it's, um, you know, the place I've had really bad experiences. So I kind of always look like I'm telling the, the bad stories. The good stories are like on Instagram and shared in my books and things like that. But on TripAdvisor, I feel like, you know, these, this is the one where you've got to know that, you know, you've got to know this about this place, really. If you can, you know, this is, this is what it's about. And I think that's more important than ever to tell the truth and right now it's so confusing and there's so much on um, social media and uh, so many different stories so many um, things that are made up and things that are being shared by people who don't know the truth who haven't examined it and as a traveler as a explorer as somebody who who sees new landscapes even in the old you know there was uh, Marcel Proust I think he wrote is that it's not about seeing new landscapes it's about seeing old landscapes with new eyes and so every time we come home we see it differently every time we come back to a place that we've been it's a new place and our world has changed forever now our world has changed travel will have changed Travel businesses will have changed. And that's really hard. That's really hard for me. And I'm sure it's very, very hard for a lot of people who are traveling a lot or traveling for a business or for a passion. And we have to adapt. You know, we have to grow and we have to adapt. And one of the ways that we can do that is to make sure that we're traveling right now and that we're consciously traveling right now, as we travel through our lives, through our days, that we try not just to mark the days off a calendar, we try not to just mark off, you know, tick, 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 but that we use this experience and we learn from it and we grow from it and we use all our skills as observers, as people who live. And that's one of the things that, that so many people I've met who travel and I talk to, and I did as well, It's you know, it's, it's stepping outside of the comfort zone. It is um, doing what you're afraid to do. It is, um, you know, doing something you thought you never could be capable of. And right now, for me, the challenge is to do things like this, to sit here and talk. My challenge is to sit and read from my books. My challenge is to teach my, my classes. My challenge is to find new ways of being in this world, of knowing whether I should wear a face mask or not, of knowing uh, enough to repeat um, articles and things like that on social media or not, to question everything. When somebody, when I say, is it safe? You know, is it safe to walk around here? Is it safe to do this? If I'm getting the correct answer nine times out of 10, I need to make sure that I'm not falling into the trap of that one in 10. Because when I went out for that walk from the hostel, which was also in Mexico, I went out for that walk. That could have been the end of my life, quite easily. It was a very dangerous area. Now those people who ran the hostel, they had no bad intention. They were so, in a way, innocent. But I don't use that in a good way. <laughs> because they were running a hostel, but they weren't aware, they weren't conscious because they, I think they just didn't want to believe how bad the town that they were in was. 
They didn't want to believe how dangerous it was. And you can see that there's so many parallels with where we are right now, that there are so many people who don't want to wake up to what's, what's going on, to our dangers. They want to say, yes, it's safe to walk around. But as an explorer, as a traveller, you need the truth. You know, you don't need a glossy magazine brochure. You don't need somebody telling you um, it's not safe around here. So many times when I was traveling, I would wake up and I would get up early and I would go for a wander and I would go off somewhere and I would end up having quite a morning and I would get back. Sometimes if I was checking out, I would get back, you know, sort of 10 o'clock or something. And I'd had a whole day. I'd have gone wandering off here and I'd have been to a market and I'd have gone there and I'd have walked down here and I'd have gone off the pier and I'd done that. And I come back and they say, oh, where have you been? I say, well, I've been here, I've been here, I've been here. And it was all perfectly safe. And they'll say, whoa, that's really dangerous. You shouldn't, shouldn't have gone there on your own. You shouldn't have done that. But to me at that time, it felt perfectly safe. And I'm reminded of um, when I went to Marrakesh. You know, it's one of the places I really love is Marrakesh. And the last time I went, uh, we stayed in a place outside of the city and I went, my sister came with me and we wandered around and we went to the same restaurant a couple of times, a really great restaurant in the um, the main square. <laughs> I can't see it, Jemen El Fanar or whatever it's called. Yeah. And not that long afterwards we came home and we were at home and th that restaurant was bombed uh, because you know it was a tourist target. And so something can be safe one day, and then another day we can be right in the, the path of tragedy and destruction. And so for me, I always say, you know, you have to listen to your heart. You have to know when it's safe to go. And I keep talking about, you know, when you're standing looking at the sea, and it's kind of like, what is a good day to get out on the boat and go out and do something? And I've been out in Hong Kong, I've been out on a junk boat, and I think it was like a um, f level four um, storm, you know, and they go out in everything. They go out in everything and, that, and they, that's how they do it. And it was an incredible experience and I really loved that. But the, the sailors felt, were so assured, you know, because they, they said, well, we go out in this all the time. Whereas in another place, you know, you wouldn't go out in that weather. There's a place in Scotland I go to, or I've been to, and um, the Isle of Arran. It's a very beautiful place. I think I've looked at the Isle of Arran. And they have a, um, what's it called? Sacred Island. I can't remember what it's called now. <laughs> Basically, it's a little island, a holy island. There you go. And there's a little man that goes over in a little boat. And so you go down and you find out what time he's going. And uh, he's a law unto himself. And you'll go down and I walked down to this and he said, today, he goes, no, not going out. He said, I'm going over, but I'm just going to go and bring the people off the, the island who've got to go home. You know, it's safe enough for me to go over, but I ain't taking anybody else over there. Because uh, on a good day, he'll go and take people over in the morning. They can walk around and then come back in the evening. On a bad day, he'll just go the once. That's the, you know. And on a really bad day, he won't go at all. And it's this tiny stretch of water. But... That man is the law and he will decide when it's safe to go and when it's not. And you can sit there and crab all you want. You can sit there and say, here's loads of money and all this. And he'd be like, no, not going, not going. <sighs> so safety is important. Truth is important. And whatever skills you've learned from travel, you know, be aware that right now, those skills are more important than ever in being able to perceive the truth, in being able to feel the truth, in right now, where we cannot all get on a plane and travel and go somewhere new, it's gonna be more and more important to hear from the people where they are, what's going on. So if you're sitting somewhere and you're saying, well, I can't write about this because I'm in the same place as yesterday, you're not. <laughs> you're in a new, town, you're a new city, you're a new person, and this is a new world. This is a new world, and we 
I, I have a feeling, you know, that maybe it's true, maybe it's not, I don't know. I have a feeling that we need everybody, that all our skills would be useful. And that in this new world, we have to remain aware, not to go to sleep, not to wake up when this is over, not to spend all our time planning, you know. When I was in Wimbledon and I was waiting to sell the house, I desperately practiced, you know. I desperately practiced. I got up, I went out, I climbed trees. And sometimes I'd go places that were not so safe. And I would get that feeling of this is not that safe. So even though I was in place and even though I was um, not able to do so many things that I wanted to do, I was still learning and growing and understanding that it was safe most mornings to get up early, to go out, to greet the dawn. It was safe most times to climb a tree. But also to be aware and to get that fine-tuned awareness of, I was walking somewhere where people have been up all night and are pretty drunk and it is not safe to hang out with them. So it was almost becoming like that animal again, you know, becoming that cat that can go out and that can pause and learn and not just rush into things, you know, not just to go off. And I ended up, when I did go off, I went off completely clueless and I had a lot to learn, so, so much to learn. And if you're an experienced traveler, if you've been to many places, look at those skills, look at what you've learned, look at how you can adapt them. But most importantly, keep being an observer. Be an observer of this world because we have been, you know, many of us have told stories, you know, we travel to different places and we tell stories about what we've seen and how things are. And it's so important for all the other people who want to get to know this world, because many of them cannot travel. And many of them may not be able to travel now uh, when they could have before. And one of the things I discovered when I went traveling I went and did all these amazing things I was often traveling with people who were retired older people and they all said to me I wish I'd done it when I was your age I wish I'd done it when I was younger because this is really tough on the body you know and a lot of people put travel off until they retire they say one day I'll do this when I've got enough money I'll do this da, 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 da. and sadly for a lot of people they may have missed the boat. They may have missed the boat and now not be able to go to certain places. And it's incredibly sad, but we, we travel for them. You know, we travel for them, we share our stories for them. So maybe right now, the most important thing you need to do as a traveler is to sit down and tell your stories and share and give to all the people who want to know what it was like. They want to know what it was like to live in Paris. They want to know what it was like to go to Bhutan. You know, they, and they want to know the truth. They don't want, just want, most people, they always like the bad stories. <laughs> they like the stories when I fell over. They like the stories when it all went horribly wrong. So don't, don't deny them those because we know we've all got them, you know, and we like the beautiful picture of us, you know. That. We like that picture, it looks great. But honestly, it's there's a truth. There's usually a much longer story behind it. But right now we need everybody. We need everybody to be honest and to be explorers and to tell the truth about where we are and what's going on. And that, that I think is very important to our global freedom. It is very important when people share stories about different countries and not just what the tourist information office tells you, not just what, um, you know, the advertising and marketing team of a country will tell you, but what the truth is about what's going on, whether that's about development or animals or anything else. So 
If you have been places, you have a power. If you have a keen eye, you have a power. And if you can tell stories, you have a power. So don't wait. You know, this is what I always say to people when they've been talking about traveling and doing things. And, and it doesn't matter if it's writing a book or going on a trip or anything like that. Don't wait. Don't wait. So don't wait for this to be over to be an explorer. Because there are a lot of aspects of being an explorer. And some of it is just writing it down. Some of it is just sharing the wisdom that you've learned. So I think around this planet there are riches. There are riches of all the skills and stories and beauty of the people who have already started exploring and been exploring this world. And I love hearing the stories from my grandma about what it was like during the 60s in America and in Canada when they traveled there and when they lived there. And I love hearing those stories because it, it tells me the truth about that time from somebody who I absolutely trust. And she tells me so many stories and I'm so grateful for that, you know. But some people don't have a storyteller in their family. Some people might not have a traveller in their, in their family. So you have to share it with a bigger family. And it doesn't matter if you just tell one person. It doesn't matter if you just start sharing and exploring and telling the truth. And I'll just finish on one thing because I, I, I like to try and keep this under the <laughs> Travel is an incredible practice. It's a most extraordinary and beautiful practice for finding truth and connecting and all kinds of things. And it's like meditation in that respect. You know, meditation is a beautiful practice for, for connecting with the truth. And when we do that, when we meditate and connect with the truth, it's so powerful, but it can also be addictive. And there's a very famous story of a, a young man who goes to a, a monk and he says, oh, if I, if I meditate every day, you know, for four hours, how long will it take me to find enlightenment and the truth? And the older wise man monk says, mm, well, maybe about 10 years. And he says, really? He said, well, what if I meditate for eight hours a day? And the monk goes, mm. he said, well, then it will take you 20 years. <laughs> Because meditation that gets in the way of living prevents us from finding enlightenment. When we start to use meditation as a drug, it stops us from touching truth. And travel can be like that. Because if we are traveling so hard and so fast and with an ego attached, you know, like, so the meditation is like, oh yes, I'll, I'll, I'll meditate for this long. Meditate as much as you need when you need it. You know, that's it. Travel as much as you need when you need it. Eat as much as you need when you need it. Exercise as much as you need when you need it. You know, but we, we create all these rules about, you know, I have to go to this many um, continents or countries or cities and these are the must-see places and these are 50 places I must go before I die and da 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 da. Everybody's different. Everybody's different and there are places that no one has ever heard of that was like the only tourist. I literally have been like the only tourist in many places. And people say, well, why did you go there? And I'm like, I've no idea. But something, something happened there. There was a little town. And not, it's actually not a town. I don't even know it's a real place. There was a name on a sign near Johannesburg called Bufule or Bufool something happened to me there driving along that road that was so profound and so deep but there is no person on the planet who will ever say well you really must go to Bufule you must go to Bufule it's so great it's not I don't even know what it is but something happened if that was one of the most important places I've been to in my entire life something happened to me there that really changed things So remember, you you are where you are, you know, you're here for a reason. This place has a lot to teach you. This time has a lot to teach you. So just open up. You know, you can be the kind of traveller, 
and we all met them you know when you're traveling who <laughs> we have a <laughs> well, it's not a joke it's actually quite true the english traveler is the one that takes this big suitcase full of tea and biscuits and marmite i got my marmite on tuesday i'm very excited i went to the supermarket and got my marmite uh, but i didn't take marmite with me when i was traveling around the world i thought you know i'll just go with what what i find along the way uh, but yeah, we can be the person that takes, you know, I do take tea bags, I take tea bags. Um, and, you know, we can be the kind of person that that brings our own food and won't try anything local. And we can be the person that says, no, I have to be rigid and I have to be in bed at this time and I'm going to get up at this time when there's a great party going on or when, you know, there's a monsoon or there's a sunrise or there's something happening really wonderful or there's northern lights and you end up freezing your ass off in a field for hours. You know, you go with the flow, I think. I think I think the people who get the most out of travel and of life go with the flow and embrace what's what's there. So I think if you apply that attitude and that joie de vivre, you know, that we are alive and anything is possible and we can discover. And even for some of us, we may have to catch up with some living. You know, that we may have been to some places and had some experiences, but we haven't actually let those experiences in. We haven't actually let those experiences change us. And so now is a great time to allow, allow and to process and to feel all the traveling that we've done and catch up to ourselves. And be so grateful for all the experiences that we've had and to live and to travel and to explore and to observe and to be alive, to be alive in this moment and in this place. And don't wait, don't wait to, don't wait for some possible future or some possible place because we don't know what's going to happen next. So all we can live is today. Today is, today is the only place we can live and this place we're always going to live and be in this place. I hope it helps. Lots of love.